Excellent. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Richmond, hey, you guys. And um, looking forward to asking you a few questions about Brassic. Yeah. I um, went to the screening last night and uh, good atmosphere there. It got a lot of laughs. Yeah, it? thank God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was really nervous, man. I, I really was. That's the first time, you know, the, the, one of the big concerns is after, after you know, you get in the edit and, and come out the other end. and. And now it's about, you know, have your jokes landed, do them poignant moments, the, the, the sort of, uh, the real drama, does it hit home and, and what's the reaction going to be? And because it was such a, uh, there was such a big audience there, we really got to, f we got an insight into what you are going to feel at, at home on the couch. So that was the first, you know, that was a really important, it was a big day that yesterday. I've been nervous about that for a long time, yeah. There were loads of factors that would go into whether a joke lands, whether a poignant moment lands whether it's in the writing, the concept of the idea, or the edit. I mean, mm. how much involvement have you had in the production of the show? What, where, where, where did it start? A huge amount of involvement, yeah. And it's one of my big fears, this, and, I, and I've said it a few times. I think because of the way I talk, the way I dress, and, and I'm a young man, uh, I think, it, don't underestimate my involvement in this job. It's, it, I've been in, involved from start to finish throughout every single corner of the creative aspect. Uh, I'm not just an actor on this job. I know that actors having ideas is considered quite dangerous within the industry. That's fucking dinosaurs say that kind of shit. Like, it's just not true. I've got ideas, man. And, uh, and by a fucking miracle, I seem to be bloody capable, you know. How, how do you go from having an idea to getting it on screen? Given that you have to work, I mean, it's like a five year, it's been a five year journey, you know, it's not been, I mean, and also in the grand scheme of things, that's not actually all that long. We've been very lucky with Barassic that we found Sky and, and that Sky had been so good to us, but it was a five year journey. Um, and uh, you, you, it's about creating the world. And a lot of the stuff I got up to was pretty ridiculous, you know? So a big chunk of the time spent is grounding it in some kind of reality. You know, you can steal horses, but you do, you, you have to ground that somehow in, in real life. Otherwise people are not gonna believe that. So is that, how you worked with the, the writer Stanley Brocklehurst, right? Um, how, what was your relationship like with him? How did you go about creating this stuff with him? Well, I initially I'd brought this sort of a hybrid, but I didn't know what I was doing. I had all these ideas and all these stories I wanted to tell, but I didn't know they're all in my head, really, uh, in a very non-linear way. My head doesn't work. It's, it's all sort of it's this jumble of ideas. And so what they said was, we need you to go away and write something. So I did, and I wrote like this un unusual, sort of fucked up hybrid dyslexic book that made no sense. And David was like, David Livingston, our producer, uh, said, you know, I just, I don't know whether I can do anything with this. What I'll do is I'm going to put you in touch with a writer called Danny Brocklehurst, and I, and I think you'll, I'm hoping you'll hit it off. So what I'd done, I'd inadvertently, what I was doing during this hybrid book, writing process I was teaching myself these stories in great detail to the point where when I get on the phone to Danny I can tell him like you're listening to the fucking Hobbit on audiobook you know it's like I know every detail and and, and structurally I I do have an understanding for structure um, uh, and how and, and what we can and can't do and um, I'm in the danger of waffling here now but but yeah, I mean, my involvement is, is uh, I've been very involved and one of my big fears is having done all, having been so involved and having worked so hard that people will underestimate my, me, uh, me input. I don't think they will, to be honest. I, I fucking hope for their sake they I won't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was the, the guy last night, this guy talking about, um, you know, award for the casting director. Um, and mm. I wasn't really sure what he meant until I saw her and I was like, oh shit, yeah. She's phenomenal. Fiona Weirdin, um, she's just a, a, an amazing human being uh, to start with and, and just brilliant at a job. You know, there are times where we get sent through videos and we always get fantastic and they're always brilliant. The actors are a very high standard. And if we don't feel like we've quite got there, she'll always go and take a second, third, fourth, fifth pass at it. And that's very difficult, whittling down, finding the right people for the job. It's a difficult process. And Fiona's fantastic at that. She's, she's, she really is. She deserves, she does deserve recognition. Absolutely, she does. So clearly a lot of the storylines have, have come from your experiences and stuff that come out of your head. Um, 
But I'm interested in your influences. I mean, there's a, there were a few things. I was, if I was thinking, like, what would the elevator pitch for this be? And it was a bit like, is it kind of lock, stock, meets only fools and horses? There's a few things in there. And you've worked with Shane Meadows mm. before, right? Mm. Um, mm. Was Shane a massive influence on you? Huge. Say, huge. Me. A huge influence. I learned so much from Shane. And I'd just watch him. I was saying in the last interview, I was just talking to um, Scroobius Pip, yeah. Just such a nice guy, man. Fucking hell. You get him wrong, you're a right knobhead. You know, you can't not like Pip. And I was just telling Pip about, I was telling Pip about Shane, and I get these very, you know, I get these very intense, uh, like, uh, I'll get a short amount of time with Shane throughout the years, but it'll be a very intense amount of time. And I find myself watching him a lot. I think we're quite similar in a lot of ways, actually. Um, just how obsessive we get on ideas and, and how we sort of, how we steer the ship and the stresses and pressures that come along with that job. Um, I get it now. I used to watch him and, um, you know, I heard it once. I shouldn't really, t maybe I shouldn't tell this story, but it, we, we were shooting for Vicky and when she was, she, she killed Johnny Harris in that really serious rape scene. Initially, it was meant to be a glass ashtray. And when the glass ashtray turned up, it's like this wobbly, it's never gonna work. And he just fucking went nuts. He was like, you know, this is, this is fucked now. Like, this is fucked. Like, the murder weapon is completely wrong. And I remember hearing about that and, you know, I understand the frustrations, I did, but I, 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 now I really get it. Like, we had this, I'll give you an example. We had this scene where the bloody dildo was wrong. And d dude, honestly, I nearly lost my fucking mind over this dildo in the middle of a chicken farm. Like, what the fuck is this? Like, how big, I mean, that's massive. No one can physically use that. You're not getting that in anyone, you know? <laughs> I nearly lost um, my mind over a dildo in a chicken farm. It's not really a sentence I ever Dude, I fucking went so. berserk about it. I was like, who's, who the fuck has fucked this up? This is the day we're filming today. It's happening right now. We have no options now. We have to use this dick. Like, and it's completely wrong, you know? And, and so you do, it's been a very new, it's been a learning experience. Uh, a new side to the industry that, that I've never been a part of. You know, you've got to worry about the minutiae now. Absolutely, right? yeah. I, 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 as an actor, you turn up, you need to A, be on time, B, know your lines, and have an, an understanding for the character. That's it. You don't have to worry about the dildo being wrong. You don't have to worry about a fucking glass ashtray. You don't have to worry that they've brought the wrong breed of dog that won't bite the fucking said dildo. You don't have to worry about any of that shit. You don't have to worry about falling behind on time. And, and, and all these things are now a factor for me involved in in the shooting of Brassic. These things now, you know, I need to make sure that it's, and that's new, I don't know what I'm fucking doing. I'm sort of feeling my way through as I go. Um, but it's a really enjoyable experience. I mean, being on the other side of the camera and being part of the, the creative team, it's, it's been amazing. It's been, of course I do, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I've, I've got lots of ideas and, and I feel like Brassic, what, what Brassic has taught me is actually I'm not stupid. You know, I can't read and I can't write. Um, I've got bipolar, I struggle with my behaviour all the time, my moods and... Uh, fuck, dude, honestly, I, like, I'm like a yo-yo and, and, and I've always assumed that I'm not capable, that I'm stupid and, um, and that I'm just lucky to be doing the acting, you know? And any time I have been employed, it's because someone's made a mistake, someone fucked up and it's too late now, I've already signed the contract, you know? I've, not, I've always felt like an imposter and, and for the first time in, in I, I, I don't feel like an imposter, man. I feel like I've really earned this. Um, and I feel really humbled and very lucky to be able to tell my story. Um, and it affords me the opportunity to do things like this, where they close down a kebab shop and you have a chat with a geezer who likes your show. I mean, it's just, it's like a, yeah, it's like a dream. You know, it's it really it is. Common, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. When I was researching um, the questions for this interview, I noticed you seem to be a bit of a hero in your hometown. Do you think that's fair to say? Nah. <laughs> no. Nah, I mean, that's it. I don't know whether I'm a hero, man. I, don't feel, I certainly don't feel like a hero. Um, I, I, you know, my hometown, I've got to tell you, I, I owe everything to, to the environment I, I sort of grew up in. I, I sort of lived on the outskirts of Chorley, but all my, that's where all my friends were from. And, and that's the environment that really shaped me into the man I am today. And, and it's the people that make Chorley, it's not the town. It's the, it's the human beings in it. And, and honestly, like some of, 
some of the happiest people I know are from Chorley and they have nothing. They have nothing. And, and, and some of the most intelligent men and women are working class men and women, you know, who have come, I'm like my friend, I've got Dave Jennings. He's a fighter, he's a, he's a boxer. He, he te teaches people how to knock other people out. That's a big, tough lad. And he's incredibly well read. Like, you know, Thomas Morey, he's another one. He's a, a working class lad, fucked off to, uh, he, he just read himself out of, out of the town. He managed to, you know, you do, you have to work hard to get out of Trolley and you have to really want to get out of Trolley because it can be a bit of a trap. You know, there's people who've never left that place. They're quite content in the environment they're in and how lucky are they? How lucky are they to not want not to, not have that urge to go out and see these things. They're happy with what they've got and that's, that's what I wanted to encapsulate in Barassic. It's, it's a, you know, any time we've ever looked at the working classes, it can come across really quite bleak. And often it's a middle class view on what it must be like to be working class. Well, this isn't that. We, we, we you know, the, the, the show is about, you know, you, ju just because you don't have things doesn't necessarily make you a miserable twat. You know, like, I think, I, in all honesty, I think that owning the things kind of fucks everything up a little bit. You know, you get your bloody nice house, you've got to sustain that, you've got to keep hold of that. You get your cunty kids, Tilly and Tarquin, and they need to be in fly Fred, so you don't, you know, and, and like your dishwasher and your two cars and your fucking double garage. Like, it sounds like a fucking nightmare. Like, honestly, it does. Like, I'd much rather live in a derelict house in the woods. Let's put it that way. What are you watching on TV right now? I don't watch TV. I'll tell you what I do. I don't watch any TV because I live in the woods. There's no TV, really. I'm just not linked it up. I'm not paid for my TV licence or out like that. And it's pretty shite TV, I'll be honest, like, um, with the sounds of things anyway. There's the odd good bits about Sky do some good stuff. Um, <laughs> but I watch a lot of YouTube. I've recently got into, because me, me, honestly, dude, my head never stops. It never stops thinking. And I, I like watching documentaries. And there's one, there's this guy I've got into who keeps ants, right? He keeps these different species of ants. It's like a kid's show, really. The way he talks is, you'll never guess what I found the next day, and fucking universe. Uh, bloody, bloody, blah. He's got this very irritating... I mean, I'd love to just stab him with a trident through the fucking chest. It's not him that I'm watching it for. It's the ants. They're amazing. There's all these different species of ants. You put them in these little tanks, and he watches the world, and this guy... I mean, I know I shouldn't have said the trident thing, really. I mean, fuck, he's a sweetheart. He just loves watching insects. He sits there for hours and hours watching these ants walk around these... He builds these worlds for them. And for some reason, it stops me head from thinking for a little bit. There's another thing I watch on YouTube, which is... I don't know... It's, it's, it's these people who build structures in the jungle, and it's... They don't you they only use the, the, the things from the environment around them and there's no dialogue there's no words spoken you just watch a man build a, build a hut or build a pool or, they're just unbelievably clever these men it's just skills that you develop over a lifetime and for some reason that turns me off too you know and I'm really because I do man I get very troubled like um, I can go to a very dark place so and, and often when I go there, the ants in the jungle seems to pull me out. Right. I watched two ants have a fight to the death once. Did you? Rip each other's legs off and shit. Oh, it's incredible, isn't it? Right, isn't it? Amazing. I was in Melbourne recently. I'm stood having a pint with this geezer, Rob, who definitely I couldn't trust. Like, he's going out to India to get his fucking teeth fixed and that. You know, like, he is something not right about this geezer. But we sat there in this boozer. I ended up really pissed. And we were watching wasps grab flies, pull the wings off, and then they'd fuck off with them. And we'd put, we started putting bets on. Um, he made a fortune, the twat. He was really good at it. Like, uh, I had to go home. I ran out of fucking money. I had to go back home. <laughs> fucking Rob. <laughs> Not bad. Finally, um, I think I know the answer to this, but who's the naughtiest on set? No, oh, God. It's obviously fucking me, isn't it? Christ, fucking the least professional actor you'll ever meet. Like, I'm terrible, dude. Um, I, I just want to say that for all my unprofessionalism, I, t I do take my job very, very seriously. I am never, ever late. I know every single line, every time. I make myself ill learning them fucking lines. 
I met myself ill getting in on time. You know, the idea of being late is terrifying. But once I'm there, I can't afford to take the job too seriously. Otherwise, I'll freak myself out. That's what I've learned. And also, <clears throat> I've been warned not to say this, but I do, I do partake in, in certain numbing agents through... <laughs> No, I mean, no, no, I'm not, a, I'm not well behaved. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a twat on set, yeah, yeah. I'm a concern for every single one of these people. But. I, I, I just going to go back to this, I find that really interesting that um, you nailed the script and clearly, you know, every word, it felt like every word was on the script last night. Right? It's not Actually. though, no. But um, when, yeah. when I'm watching the Shane Meadows thing, you know, he lets actors loose, right? Yeah. And you kind of do your own thing, you have mm. an outline or whatever. Mm. Um, what do you prefer to do and how hard is it for you to stay on script? Well, this is what I'd say. I think, <clears throat> like, you, you ideally, in order to be able to ad-lib, you either need to understand the character so well and the other characters with, surrounding it. So that's why Shane's stuff works. We work a lot on characters where, why do they feel the way they do? Why are they reacting the way they are? And, and so when I come to set with you guys now, I understand each and every one of your pretend people. Right? And I know what the, the potential, what they might say. I also know the arc of the story because we talk about that an awful lot. And I know not to venture too far off that if I can help it, you know. But that being said, the amazing thing about Shane is if it does start to wander off the original storyline, it'll change everything. It'll change it because that's where it's naturally gone. And that is why, that's the difference between men like Shane Meadows and the rest of, and, 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 and pe men like Danny Boyle, he's another one. Um, you know, they have the confidence to go, you know what, do, I trust you, I have the intelligence to go, you know what you're doing, and I'm gonna leave you to it. And if it means we have to change everything, then that's so be it. So on Brassic, what we are, you know, it's important to sort of, it's a much, it's much more, we don't have the time we don't have the time to, in the edit, especially, to because that's a, it is very difficult in the edit. Shane can spend up to a year in the edit. He comes out, he's gone fucking nuts, you know. Um, and we we just can't afford to do that. We don't have the time. So I, my my thing is the way I deal with it anyway is I learn my script so I can say it backwards. There was this jazz musician. This can't remember who he was. Is this this guy who played the saxophone and he was amazing at. at um, ad-lib sax he could just go off on a fucking tangent and then he'd pull it right back to what he was doing originally and the reason he could do that is because he knew those tracks so well right. he'd, he'd rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and it looked so effortless on the day but there's been an awful lot of work gone into that i i want my safety net and that safety net is the script you know and 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 the, the, there's actors that know when to and there's actors that don't you know and Shane is, is great at finding those who know when and when not to, you know. Because it's not just about what I've learned as I've gone on in my career. It's not just about, they don't always want these massive performances. Keep it real. Play the, what I, it's took years to realise it, playing the truth. And you've got to be very brave to do that to throw away certain scenes. You know, you almost feel like you're not trying hard enough. But, you know, if, if you want people to really believe you, look at any of the brilliant actors we've got, like the Daniel Day-Lewis's, Christian Bales, people like that. These lads work their ass off. Like, you know, they, they, they are machines, like, um, and they know exactly how much to give. They never give you too much. They never give you too little. They're very brave in the decisions they make. And that's why they're in the position they're in. I mean, like, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis, he's retired now, but I mean, it, it, he was always my favourite, you know, uh, he was such an odd man and, and, and I just, I get this feel, I don't know him at all, but I get this feeling he's pretty troubled, like, and I feel the same with this, with, I've never met him, I've, and probably never fucking will, but Christian Bell's another one, he's, he's one of our most, he really is, he's an unbelievable, extraordinary type of human being. You know, he went from the bloody machinist where he nearly fucking killed himself to Batman in a matter of few months. That poor twat, he's jumped on steroids, he's mashed his head to pieces to get to where, he'll do whatever it takes to get to where he needs to be. Whatever. So you can, um, risk you doing. Yeah, whatever, yeah, like he, he'll, what I'm getting around to saying is he'll, he will make the necessary sacrifices, even if that means the detriment to himself. And that's the, that's the kind of actor I want to be. I want to, 
especially with this. You know, I know I'm vulnerable, and I know a lot of this is it's very, very personal, but I, I, re I really want people to see how bloody vulnerable it is, how vulnerable it makes you, and be as honest as I can about that. And you know what, and, and, if, and if people still like me at the end of it, then maybe I am worth loving myself. I don't know. Maybe. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me, man. I really enjoyed it. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Is that from the Goonies? Nice. Hey!